just as a matter of process, if you could just say your name and spell it for us so we have it sure. correct. Sure. <laughs> Christine, Christine A. Yared, C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-E-Y-A-R-E-D. Okay, great. So, um, Chris, I just want to maybe by way of beginning, if you could talk up, talk a little bit about like, you know, sort of where you grew up and um, maybe the earliest recollections you have about when you first began sort of uh, identifying you know, uh, as a lesbian woman? Um, sure. I, I grew up in Grand Rapids and uh, went to Central High School here and then went to Michigan State. Um, I came out what I would consider to be a later age. It was uh, my mid-20s, mid to about 26, 27. Um, and so by that point, I had already been through college and law school and started working in town. Um, I can certainly look back now and, it, and I can see all the different feelings I had and all the different thoughts I had that, that probably middle school, it, it's now real clear to me that, that I uh, uh, had I been living in an age where these issues were more publicized, I'm, you know, I'm sure I would have come out to myself in middle school because that's when I can identify very clearly. And, and certainly always had a feeling that something was different about me, but I couldn't explain what it was. And, and that feeling was from a very, very young age. And, and I've since learned that's a common, a common feeling that many gay and lesbian people have in their youth. What kind of, do you remember what kind of reactions you got initially from maybe like family and friends or, you know, coworkers or anything once, when, when you first came out? Yeah, um, well, interestingly enough for, for me, the timing of it was that I was working as an attorney. I was a sole practitioner, so I didn't have an employment issue in that way. Certainly I was concerned about whether people would, would you know, want to keep me as their attorney. But the ironic part for me was when I was coming out to myself was also the time that I was representing uh, a, a lesbian woman who was accused of, of murder, her and her partner, uh, and this was in about 1987-88, were uh, accused uh, of uh, murdering patients at the Alpine Manor nursing home, and that case got a lot of publicity, and so that was a process, that was a time where I was slowly coming out to people, including friends and family, when that was happening. So, so that was a, a difficult time, but, but um, uh, you know, that, that's, that's the time frame as far as what I was doing in my life. You know, what, when you, again, when you sort of first came out at that point, which is, sounds like it's mid to late 80s, um, what would be your recollection of kind of the the, the kind of political, cultural climate in West Michigan in regards to the LGBT community at the time? Do you, do you sort of have a sure. sense of like how much sort of both physical and kind of uh, cultural space that you felt like you had or didn't have mm -hmm. at that point? If you can remember, obviously it's different than what it is now, but I'm sure. just wondering what you... Sure. Sure, we'll yeah. About that. Well, well the, the, then the positive side was the network, the Gay and Lesbian Community Network of Western Michigan existed at that point, and that was huge for me because it, it, it gave me a sense of that there were people in town, there were things going on. Um, there was, you know, there were a couple of bars, but, but that's about it. The apartment certainly was one of them. Um, and then later, in, later, sons and daughters uh, was was very important and helpful as, as, a, as a place that wasn't just a bar that you could go to and read books or have a coffee or, or meet people. Um, other than that, though, the climate was very negative. It, you know, clearly, uh, uh, from a religious standpoint, at that point, there were not any, there might have been, but there were no churches I knew of that were uh, accepting or affirming. Um, uh, I had a, I was practicing Catholic then, and, and, and my experience was uh, I was attending the Catholic Information Center downtown, which was a Paulist and more liberal uh, part, uh, group of priests. Um, when I came out to myself, I was active in that church, and I went and met with a priest, um, Father Robert Sirico, and um, he was a wonderful priest. Um, he was uh, just, you know, in terms of his sermons, I, I went and met with him privately. He pulled a book out that was about being gay and was very, very positive for me and very, you know, gave me the book and he said, you know, you need to, you know, know that this is, this is who you are and, and he was very positive. 
Um, it wasn't, it was maybe a couple years later that he left the Catholic Information Center and started locally a group that's more national, international, the Acton Institute. And there was a time a few years later where I realized that, that what he was doing with the Acton Institute was very part of it, part of the mission, not the whole thing, but part of it involved a very conservative, socially conservative agenda. And I ended up reading in the Grand Rapids Press uh, him, quotes from him that were negative about gay people. And that really, really, uh, you know, it, it was hurtful and, and very, very disappointing because I, I, don't, I, I don't think that's who he really was. Um, so that was, that was uh, difficult. Um, the other thing with the Catholic Church that happened for me personally was they came out with some statement that was kind of a, you know, you know, kind of a love the sin, not the sinner, and, and, and the specific words that the church had were that it was um, uh, that gay people should not be raising children and should not be teaching. And at the time I was in a relationship where I was helping to raise a young, young boy, Kyle is his name, and um, I was also starting to teach uh, uh, at Grand Valley. So um, that, that, you know, from that point on, I stopped going to the, to the church and haven't, haven't since. Let's, since you mentioned that you, that's the point where you began teaching at Grand Valley, let's talk a little bit about your, your experience at Grand Valley. You were already, um, you know, you are already out at that point. Um, you got hired to teach there. What do you, what do you, when you first came to, to work at Grand Valley, what do you remember about the climate there in terms of how both for both faculty and then also for students who, who identified as LGBT, um, you know, what was your recollection again of, of mm -hmm. Like the kind of climate on campus at Grand Valley, and if you could sort of weave into your response, like what year that was. Yeah. Um, well, I started teaching as an adjunct, but when I was first, it was in 1993, around then, uh, 1992, 1993, that I started. That they, they um, I was teaching as an adjunct. They had a professor leave in the middle of the year, and they asked me to come on as a visiting professor. And so that was the first time I was there, more more uh, full time. Um, at that point, I was pregnant with my daughter, who's now 18. Um, I had her through al alternative insemination. Um, so the people who hired me were a part of the criminal justice department. There, there were no questions asked. Um, I, I was uh, uh, I was not uh, closeted, but I wasn't announcing it. But they knew I was pregnant, and and you know didn't have a, wasn't married, uh, didn't have a, a boyfriend at least that. You know, they, 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 there was nothing like that that would have made them think differently. Um, so that was positive, but when I did get into the school and taught more, I, I was disappointed um, in, in, in two ways. One, I, I did find that the students, and it could have been the program I was in, um, a lot of the students were very uh, conservative, very negative on that issue. Um, I taught criminal justice, constitutional law, courses like that. Um, it wouldn't be unusual um, for there to be papers that students would write, and, and if there was a relevance to a gay issue, that they would be negative. And, and I did get that it, because I was active in the gay community, there were times when I was on the news or newspaper or, or things like that, and I did get negative evaluation comments from some students about saying that I was, you know, trying to, you know, like I'm putting my agenda on them, that those kinds of comments. Um, as to the climate at Grand Valley, what was positive was there were women and men that I got to meet who were professors or who worked in other capacities at Grand Valley who were gay, lesbian, out. Um, and, and so that was positive, but as far as all of the various issues, the climate wasn't good. There, there were no um, anti-discrimination uh, policies, um, you know, domestic partnership benefits, all those things were, were not uh, were not there. Um, and then there was a student group, 10% uh, of you that, that existed, and I was a, an advisor for that group. And, uh, and again, it was a small group of students, but they were, um, you know, w were active. And then there, at one point there was a movement on the part of, of uh, faculty and staff uh, that had been met with President Lovers at the time who, who, who asked them to put together a list of recommendations about, you know, okay, what is it that you think needs to happen to kind of move 
the campus forward on this issue, this issue. I mean, were you involved in that process at all? And what do you remember about that that time leading up to maybe the first attempt to get domestic mm -hmm. partner benefits? Yeah, I, I was a part of that, and and uh, there was a. Um, I would say that President Lovers, his his response was positive to the extent that he was he moved forward. Eventually, the, 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 there was a lot before that, but eventually he moved forward and set up a task force, and I was a part of that task force, and we came up with a written list of recommendations. Um, we were very disappointed after we finished the process because, um, you know, the, the reaction to, to some of the recommendations was not positive. Um, my sense was that President Lovers was not homophobic. He was more concerned about the financial issues. And I certainly remember, um, you know, at one point he was, I thought, was going to move forward with the domestic partnership benefits. And the, uh, there was an article in the paper that covers this, but basically um, uh, Dick DeVos, uh, uh, who is the, the father, the original Amway owner, he was uh, uh, upset about that. He, the family is a major funder for Grand Valley. And, uh, you know, he, he, at least what his quote was in the paper was that he called President Lovers and told him that he needs to obey the law and that he shouldn't, shouldn't do this. And, and President Lovers did back off then. Um, so that, that was disappointing, um, but, you know, it, that, that, was, that did seem like the, the issue that it was more financial as it related to President Lovers. Now, there were other um, faculty and administrators, some were very negative, and, and that was a problem, others weren't. And, and, then, um, and then, so when did you end up leaving Grand Valley? Uh, what year was that? Um, around uh, 2000. Okay. Okay. Well then, maybe to kind of historically back up a bit then, so you, you had mentioned that the importance that the, that, that the network had played in your, you know, as a place that, you know, you could, that, Feel like there's support and resources and so forth, um, and at one point you end up being the president of the network, if I'm Correct. not mistaken. So could you talk a little bit about your maybe your experience of the network first, maybe just becoming a member and then becoming more actively involved mm -hmm. in, in being in kind of a leadership role? Yeah, um, it was um, like I said, it was the one identifying group that was out there that that got you know the fact that it was in the newspaper. They'd have their annual pride celebration, and and that was going on before I had come out to myself. Um, and so certainly when that was there, that was a very positive thing. And and, and I did attend those events at you know at that point, and, and I uh, met people and and slowly got involved. Um, I got involved on the the network board, and then eventually as president of the board, um, but, but without a question, the network, and I would add sons and daughters, were two very, very positive things that were amidst an otherwise, you know, more negative atmosphere in West Michigan. And the network certainly, from what we've getting from everybody else, played, you know, a lead role in the organizing the, the early Pride celebrations, as well as the whole campaign to get Grand Rapids to pass a, sort of a gender, you know, uh, neutral sort of uh, ordinance, anti-discrimination ordinance. Um, <clears throat> that sounds like that maybe that's a little bit before your your involvement. Is that, correct. Is that correct? Okay. Okay. But um, I mean, obviously. So, what was the kind of the focus of the years that you were on the board and when you you were the president? What were what would you say the things that the network was focusing on at that point? Um, certainly, the Jerry Crane, um, his story was happening at that point. I, I was on the board when that happened, and that's. Um, I did not know Jerry then or his partner Randy. I got to know them when they were going through that process in terms of uh, after he was outed by a student at, at his school. Uh, the network, um, you know, w one of the interesting things going on was that there were certainly, there was a diverse set of views like in any movement on what's the best way to proceed. And, and we had people like uh, Jeff Swanson who I, uh, you know, respect very, very much. He's done a lot of great things. Um, his his approach and his emphasis was that we needed to be more active, and that he, you know, he wanted that. You know, why don't we go and, uh, you know, go to Byron Center and pick it and that kind of thing. Um, 
Jerry Crane did not want that, and Jeff and those who did respected that, and they, they, didn't, they weren't gonna force something that would have been negative for him, given what he was going through. But there was always that kind of attention. In other words, um, we live in West Michigan, some people say you, 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 know, you, you go slowly, you make relationships, and you slowly get change. Other people would say, no, you have to get out there in people's faces and get on the streets and, and, and get attention. And, 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 you know, I think both are needed, and I think that's what affects change is both of those things happening. Um, so we got involved in terms of, in not as a formal organization, but the people who were a part of the network board. Um, you know, people were attending different, uh, you know, the school meet, school board meetings and things like that. Um, I was president of the board when when Jerry died, and that was. Uh, he went into the hospital, it was December of 1996, and um, he died uh, the first week in January, 97. Um, our board made a decision when, when he died, we wanted to raise money to do an ad in the newspaper, and that was one of the most um, amazing experiences in the sense that we got on the phone and started calling people. We had to raise money very quickly because we wanted it to be on for his, uh, the day of his memorial service. And the response from our membership was incredible. It, it was certainly the first time I had had that type of experience where people were willing, you know, they were, they were thanking us for calling to ask for money, they were thanking us for doing something, they donated money, we ended up having enough to put the ad in and to make a donation to the scholarship fund that was established in Jerry's name. Um, some of the people, when we made those calls, were upset that we hadn't done something sooner and, and felt that they wished we had done something sooner as an organization. Um, but it was a, um, the, the response we got was very positive at that time. On the flip side of that, kind of the whole, everything that was happening and that sort of, you know, with, with Jerry Crane's situation, you know, there was the, there was the sort of the, the very nasty video that was distributed um, um, that was very anti-gay uh, in its orientation, obviously coming from kind of the religious right and so forth. Um, you know, there were uh, ministers, there were some administrators at the school and so forth. I mean, what, what do you recall about, you know, again, as somebody yourself who was a part of an LGBT organization, somebody who was out, uh, a lesbian woman at the time, um, but just in terms of how that felt to kind of experience that kind of vitriol that, that, that people were expressing both verbally and, and, and in just videos and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what does that do to your, to one's psyche, you know, just to, to know that there are people who like really mm -hmm. express hatred towards you? Yeah, that, I mean, yeah, it's a horrible feeling. Um, and, and when I was served on the president of the network, it, we, we did get hate mail also, and so I would, I would get that hate mail. And, and, and some of it was, you know, it, it was always, not always, but mostly anonymous. Um, and it would be in a form of something, you know, it could be, you know, Bible quotes or things like that, or it could be someone writing an angry letter about what they thought of us and what would happen, you know, you know, in their, in their belief, you know, their religious beliefs and all of that. Um, so yeah, that, that the, the hard part for me when that was going on was knowing that, um, I was older enough where I had already come out. I was living out, you know, in terms of everything I did, my work and family and all of that. Um, so what was really hard is just knowing what that meant for those students and for other students that were hearing about this and other gay people who were younger that were, that were you know, debating what to do. And yeah, the idea and, and, and you know, the, uh, uh, the film, I, I, I have the, the, the book that was sent out, very, yeah, negative myths, it was all the uh, very extreme, you know, uh, negative statements that are not fact-based and, and, you know, just horrible uh, statements. Um, that's what I felt bad about was I, you know, I'm certainly aware of the fact that many gay people commit suicide over that issue, and often it's the religious angle that, that's the hardest for many people. Um, so I, I felt really bad just knowing what that was doing to other young people that were struggling with that issue at the time. I mean, the Jerry Crane incident is one manifestation uh, you mentioned, you know, the boss contacting lovers, you know, about that issue on campus. 
Uh, and one of the things we've been asking everybody is that, you know, because we're, you know, this is West Michigan, and, and certainly the religious right is, uh, is you know, it's not a, they're not a minority. They're, they're pretty organized. They have money. Uh, mm -hmm. They finance campaigns to try to undermine efforts to, for more equality for the LGBT community. But so besides the example specifically with what happened with Jerry and then like your experience, you know, with what happened in Grand Valley with the funding issue, I mean, what's your, what's your sort of feeling about that dynamic that exists? That there is sort of an organized, well-financed entity that, you know, is not shy about, you know, what they think and feel about um, the LGBT community. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think. Yeah. It, it's a. It's a huge problem, and it's a huge problem in in a lot of different aspects. I, I think the, um, you know, the family aspect is one that's often glossed over. These are often people who have views that they say are pro-family, um, but they don't seem to have a s understanding of the fact that we are all from families. We are all part of families, and and many of us have children, and and uh, so there's that. You know, disconnect, and yeah, it's 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 very uh, uh, negative. It it, it certainly um, causes a lot of problems internally for people in terms of how do you deal with that? What you know, wh where do you take those those feelings that you have when you're hearing that those kinds of things stated by people like you said who have money and power and who people that might otherwise be good on an issue are going to follow in their lockstep of what they want. Well, you also have been involved with, uh, over the years in Grand a group called GLSEN. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Maybe, mm -hmm. you know, say what GLSEN stands for for people sure. who are not familiar, and then just say what, you know, what that group is, in, what is doing and, and what their focus was. Right. Uh, GLSEN is the Gay and Lesbian Straight Education Network. It's a group that was started by Kevin Jennings, who was a teacher uh, and, and started this organization. It's a national organization. Um, their focus is on K through 12 education and, and on making it a safe place for students uh, and dealing with other relevant issues. Um, after Jerry died, there was a local group that got started. I wasn't a part of that group that started it, but, but a group of people locally got together who were in education or had connections in that regard, and they started that, the, the, the local chapter, local Grand Rapids Glisten chapter. And I got involved um, over time to be a part of that board, and then eventually I was served as the chair of that board. Um, you know, local, what GLSEN does is they start these what are called GSAs, they're Gay Straight Alliances. And uh, East Grand Rapids High School was the first GSA in West Michigan, and that, and that was a huge, huge step. Um, we had uh, Forest Hills had a couple of chapters next, and, or GSAs, I should say, and, and then it spread. Um, I think what the, the story there that's so amazing is that how these GSAs get started is that there's usually one or two students that do it. And, and Glisten, Glisten does not go to students and ask them to do this. The students have to want to do it, and then they come to Glisten. And so you, you see these just amazing you know, high school kids and even junior high um, who on their own or with a friend go to their principal and say, we want to do this. And um, they're often, I mean, you know, it's never been the case at least to this date in West Michigan, where it's, uh, oh great, let's do this. Um, it's, it's a very, very tough uh, road for those students who, who, who are the ones who start it, and yet these students come forward. Um, you know, I, I know one student who did that, and she was, uh, came out, her parents kicked her out of the house. She was living uh, in her car, going to high school, but she moved forward on starting uh, a GSA. So, um, you know, the, the, the high school kids that do that uh, have a lot of, lot of courage and, and take a lot of flack for doing that often. I'm trying to remember what year it was that the East Grand Rapids um, GSA chapter? I, I don't, but I, I, I have that information. Okay, yeah, so yeah. So. And certainly it, was, it would have been after Jerry's death, right. uh, and it wasn't right away, so okay. yeah. Okay, great. Um, well, and, and this is something, and if you don't want to talk about this, this is, this is fine, but you know, I'm, I'm aware that you're sort of working on a book about, about Jerry. And so I'm just sort of wondering if, you want, if you're willing to speak a little bit about kind of why you, what sort of, what's sort of motivating mm -hmm. your desire to sort of do that? What, what do you think 
Why does he think it's important that people know mm -hmm. his story? Yeah, um, yeah. I'm, I'm working on a book about Jerry Crane's life. I've interviewed a lot of people, and I'm, I'm uh, real excited about it. Um, I, I was really moved personally by Jerry. I, I did not know him until he went through this, and I got to know him a little bit, and we got together a few times, you know, socially with his partner and my partner at the time. Um, but mostly, I got to know him through how he responded to what was happening. And he was just an amazing person. I mean, they, they couldn't have picked, um, you know, a person that, I mean, he, he embodied all of the positive things you'd want in a teacher. He, was, he loved what he was doing. He was passionate. He loved students. He cared about them. He really did care about them. Um, he, he, you know, I've, I've been able to learn through talking to students of different students who he really helped individually who weren't going to do well in music and did well because of him. And, and when he went through this, he just had such, you know, he had, he had class and dignity throughout the whole thing. And he kept his head up as good as he could. He went to work. He tried to focus on his teaching, uh, his students. And he was treated just horribly, just, just you know, isolated. Um, all kinds of accusations were made of, of, about him, about things that he didn't do these things that, that were alleged. Um, and it was just a horrible, horrible school year that he, he had basically, he was out at the beginning of that school year, and he stayed the whole school year. Um, so when he, when he died, um, that, that was when I first thought about that I wanted to do that. Um, at that time, I, was, I had my own practice raising kids and all of that, and, and a part of me felt like I wanted it to settle a little bit because I felt like it would be a, um, well, now I wished I had maybe interviewed people right away, you know, when it was more fresh. I did have a sense that, that I w wanted some, some time to, to gel. Um, and so I think it's, um, I think it's an amazing story. I, I think, um, you know, people need to know not just what he went through, but how he handled it. And, and the irony, I think, for many of the students is that they, they learned a huge lesson out of this, but the lesson was through Jerry, and it was how he, they knew him to be a wonderful teacher, and they, and they grew up with their, their uh, other teachers and their parents and the community loving him, and they saw how that one fact, now he got married to a, or had a commitment ceremony with another man, and they saw how this one little fact changed everybody's views about him in terms of many of the adults that they, that they you know, respected, and, and so, um, you know, the irony is, is, you know, he lost his life because of that, but he was really the one that taught the lesson in terms of, you know, how, what it means to be a good teacher, a good person, how do you handle, you know, uh, that type of uh, behavior. Um, so he was an incredible role model, and I think, I think it's, a, it's an incredibly uh, compelling story, and he's a, a real inspiration to many, many students who are now adults raising their own kids. I mean, obviously from the time that you, uh, you know, in the 80s when you yourself um, came out and to where we are now, you know, almost, uh, you know, 30, 30 some years, 30 some years later, I mean, obviously a lot has changed, you know, uh, certainly some of it for the positive, for the better and whatnot. Um, but, you know, folks who are maybe Growing up now and just maybe beginning to you know, identify as LGBTQ, you know, Q, um, maybe aren't aware of like, mm -hmm. what people went through, like right. Jerry and so forth. Uh, so, how important do you think it is for, you know, I mean, not just young LGBT students, but just young people in general to sort of mm -hmm. realize that the only way we got to where we are is because people like, you know, took risks. Right. So right. What, what do you, how how important do you think it is for the current and future generation to understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think mean, it's essential. I, I think it's, a, you know, you can look at any civil rights movement and, and there were always people who, who died, you know, initially or whose lives were ruined for different reasons as they were trying to stand up for just, uh, you know, to be able to do what they want or be who they were. Um, so I think it's essential, and, and I think it, it helps us form just as when we're all young, we, we read about, people who came before us, and it can serve as an inspiration as to how you want to live your life. And so I think it's so important. Um, and, and I think one thing I've learned, too, is that 
I think many of us who are older can look at the coming out issue for kids and think, you know, oh, they've got it easy and there's all these TV shows and movies and all of that. I've, I've you know, what I've found is that it's still, a, you know, even with such a different environment, it's still a huge thing. And even for somebody who's a teenager to come out to their parents, when those of us who are older would look at it and say, well, you know, so much has changed, you shouldn't be worried about it. Um, it's a huge step for them still. Um, and of course, we know of the, you know, the huge problems at that the teenage suicide rate or, or uh, the bullying and all of that. So I think it's important that people know that, that it's not, for those young people, it's not just a, an easy, uh, you know, upbeat thing to just come out and uh, move forward. One last question that I had, Chris, was just that um, there, there haven't been many members of the LGBT community we've been interviewed that aren't also Caucasian, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, what's been your experience as an Arab American woman who also mm -hmm. identifies as lesbian within kind of the, both within sort of the LGBT community itself, but, you know, you know, some people would certainly argue, even folks within the community saying, like, it's sort of like, um, it's sort of like, okay, you're a woman, you're a lesbian, and you're Arab. It's sort of like a, it's like a triple uh -huh. sort of whammy in some ways in terms of this very, you know, homophobic, heterosexist sort of, uh, you know, kind of male dominant culture. I mean, mm -hmm. how do you, uh, what's been your experience of that as being a, being also being an Arab woman who's also gay? Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I would say that, um, you know, first of all, I think that's true and it's true historically in our whole gay rights movement that the, you know, that it has been more white male. And I think after the AIDS, you know, there were more, there were, you know, women came into leadership because unfortunately a lot of the men were, were, were sick and needed help and were uh, dying. Um, and, and I think the same thing happened locally here. You know, there, there were more, there was more male leadership in West Michigan initially, and then over time that changed. Um, I'm, and, and as someone who was on the network, I, you know, would add that that was always an issue for us: is how do we reach out to other communities? Um, for myself personally, I would say growing up, you know, Arab American, it hasn't been a negative. There's been, I've had people make comments, you know, and, and still today I hear comments that are more of ignorance, um, but I don't feel that I've been discriminated against for being Arab. Um, American. Certainly, um, I, I think in West Michigan, you know, the religious uh, issue is is probably one of the biggest negatives. I think for many gay people is is feeling um, either you know that they don't have a home in a religion they grew up in, uh, and that our community is so focused on you know many conservative religious views that that's a huge, you know, I think, I think that's the huge, you know, huge obstacle for those in West Michigan. Well, I didn't have any other questions, but if there are things that have happened in the last 30 years in Grand Rapids that you think, you know, you want to speak to, I mean, feel free to. Sure, I, well, one thing I would like to just mention is about having a child um, through alternative insemination, and, and I, um, when the, when I went to have decided to have a child, I was with an, an, in a relationship with another woman. Um, we first talked about adoption, and we found out that we couldn't adopt unless we would lie about who we were. So for us to to get through the home study in West Michigan in the early 90s, we would have had to have said that we were, you know, like I would have we had to be friends, and we had would have had to show separate bedrooms and all of that. Um, so then I, we looked into the uh, other methods and decided to, to go with uh, alternative insemination. Um, it was, that was very difficult. There were, um, just as now, you know, many of the hospitals are, the, the money behind hospitals and medical practices is often in West Michigan more conservative. Um, and so I was very surprised to find that it was hard to find someone who would provide that service for me, even though they would do it. If I was, if I was married and I said, you know, I couldn't get pregnant, they would provide that service, but they wouldn't provide it for a, a single woman or a woman who was out, you know, as being lesbian. Um, 
there, so when I decided to do that, there weren't um, many people doing it. There were some that I that I didn't know personally, but just word of mouth talked to when they, you know, word of mouth spread to certain doctors. Um, the first doctor I went to, he was willing to do that, but he said he wanted me to take a psychological exam first. And at that point, the fact that he was going to do it sounded very good, and so I went and took the psychological exam. And while I was there taking it, I realized that this is this is ridiculous. I'm, I, you know, this this is this shouldn't be the doctor that I work with. Well, I, I finished the test. I passed the test. He he got his results and said he would move forward. But but I looked for another doctor and found a different doctor who who did that without you know requiring anything uh, first. Um, so, you know, I, I think that part of our history is important for people to know because today that is more of an option for, for you know, LGBT, you know, men and women. In terms of having children, there's more options now, and I think it's important for them to know that it wasn't that long ago that those options weren't here, and, and I'm sure that there's still certain doctors that would not provide that service, so. Okay. Okay. I was, uh, Sure. Sure. Just yeah. Same way with Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. Jeff, you could ask the question, or if you're just ready to go into it, that's fine. Um, well, yeah. The 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 process um, of coming out we, 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 as a gay or lesbian individual, you come out to yourself first, and and that's. Um, a, a very long process, and for, for me it happened because I met somebody who was lesbian and, and I had, uh, you know, a, that type of a feeling towards her that I had not had before, even though I had dated men before. So for me, that was the way it came out, you know. Um, I, I certainly can see and wish that it was different and that, you know, certainly for gay and lesbian people, um, the, the idea of knowing your sexuality when you're young is so essential because that's the whole idea of dating and getting to practice and getting to figure out what you want and who you want and all that. Um, there's an important process that goes on uh, when you know your sexuality and I, I also find it ironic that there's so many people who are they're pro heterosexual marriage and what they're missing is that if they would um, have and, and encourage a society that was more open and, and accepting of all people, um, it would be less likely that, that there would be marriages ending in divorce, which often happens if somebody doesn't come out to themselves until later in life. So it's, it's ironic to me and, and, and sad that many people go through a heterosexual marriage and then, and maybe have children, and then later they f figure out their own identity, or later they feel the courage to, you know, to step out and be who they are, and um, you know, and, and so in, in a real way, you know, everybody benefits if we have a more open society. That's great. Uh, actually, I had one other, just as a follow-up, sure. just does not be very long, but you, you mentioned the importance of having a place like Sons and Daughters mm -hmm. as a place to go. Um, so I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about your own experience of being there and yeah. sort of use, you know, sort of use sons and daughters in your response. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, I mean, sons and daughters was huge uh, for people at, in, in terms of you know at the time they opened because the only other choices were the bars and 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 you know first of all you know bars are limited they're they're open at night and they're for you know a purpose of you know you're drinking or dancing or going with a group um, this was the first uh, place it was a coffee house before coffee houses were popular in west michigan or anywhere uh, in our country um, it was they had books and and this was the time now we can go into Schuler's or borders or uh, Barnes and Nobles and ask for openly ask for books about gay and lesbian issues. Um, back then, none of those bookstores carried books. They didn't carry the magazines. And so here was a place where you could go, you could find books, newspapers, magazines. They had a you know coffee, desserts. You could invite someone to come and and just get to know somebody. You could you know have this place, and it was the only place you know that existed other than you know uh, uh, some bars. 
And then the, the lesbian uh, community network, gay and lesbian network existed, but again, you know, it's different. You're there for an event or you're there for a meeting, um, whereas, you know, sons and daughters, that was huge. And, you know, at that time I was with a partner. We were raising three young children. Um, they were, you know, when we got together, they were uh, two, four, and six, and, and we could bring them there. So we could go there and get some coffee, and they could be in a place where they would see that there's other gay and lesbian people, and they would see people interacting with us and interacting with them in a way that they didn't see anywhere else in their lives in terms of you know, that kind of acceptance, and there'd be books or movies or things like that. Um, so it, it, was, it was a huge uh, beacon of light you know, for many of us uh, in, in, the, in the gay community, and we're sad to see that go. Okay, one more. Oh. Just to go back to Jerry Crane, um, there must have been some uh, controversy around his death. Because oh, if mm -hmm. you know, and I, we've talked to people, other people mm -hmm. who said we're convinced that it was the stress. Right. Uh huh. But there must be, was there any conversation with people, first of all, that the people that attacked him, uh, you know, again, the religious perspective, uh, mm -hmm. this is because of his sin. Mm hmm. Yeah, and yeah, and you know what? I don't know if you did you if it, people talked about maybe they did about the uh, picking up garbage in Byron Center yes. that part of it. Okay, yes. yeah. And we have so some pictures of good, that. good. Okay, yeah, yeah. Well, um, yeah. When when uh, when Jerry died, um, there was an autopsy, and the medical examiner uh, gave his opinion, and his opinion was that Jerry had. A, um, a, a condition that he had that he knew about, um, but that it was the medical examiner's position, opinion, that it was a stress-induced, uh, you know, heart attack that he had, and, and that it was the stress. I mean, this, you know, he lived that last year of his life. He was not just front page news here. He was front page news. It was, you know, covered by national outlets. Uh, and it was covered before he died. It was covered after even, but, but, but even before he died. And so um, there's no question um, to me and to those who know the facts of what happened, um, he was just under horrible pressure daily to, to go into that building and to try to, you know, just focus on his teaching, focus on uh, the needs of the children, and he was being harassed, you know, daily, when, and home, you know, with phone calls, letters, at school, all of that. Um, so so there's, no, there's no question to those of us, I think, who knew the facts that that, you know, that that was, that caused his premature death. Um, you know what? What? Not not that I can not that I can say in terms of stories. I, I don't know. I, I, I would say one thing in terms of the issue of um, how this came about because I, I was on the board when we explored that issue of of picking up garbage in the the, the Byron Center network uh, uh, or uh, city of Byron Center. Um, what happened was after he died, you know, we were the board. We we did this ad and we did a contribution to his scholarship, but we wanted to do more, and there was a sense of, geez, now he, he's gone, he died, and we did something that related to the time frame of his uh, memorial service, but there was really a feeling we needed to do more. And one of the uh, uh, members of the board, and I remember that to be Phil Duran, is who I remember that to be, um, came up, I remember we were sitting at the board meeting and, and you could see in his mind he, he had this idea and he was kind of smiling um, because historically the Gay and Lesbian Community Network had uh, sponsored a, a uh, cleanup area that was in Ada and there was a history there of problems with that. Well, all of a sudden uh, he spoke up and he said that he looked into it and found out that there's nobody uh, that there's a stretch of road in the middle of Byron Center that is not being sponsored, and and why don't we do that? And and there was controversy about that. Some people felt like, well, why should we be doing that? And others right away thought it was a wonderful idea. And and that you know obviously if if you pick up uh, garbage for that area, the business or organization is on the sign, and so we knew it would say gay and lesbian. Uh, community network, you know, in the in the Byron Center on their streets, 
Um, I, I was a part of it the, when we did that, and the first time we did the cleanup, um, we did have a, that, that there was a positive outreach from some people in that community and, and certain churches who were upset about what happened. And they reached out to us and they joined us and they had a uh, event at their church where after we picked up garbage that day, it was on a Saturday, I think, uh, we then went to a uh, kind of a, a breakfast uh, at the church with people uh, afterwards. And, and that was, you know, that was wonderful and something that, you know, we wished, you know, that Jerry could have uh, could, could have seen that part of it because he had no experience of people reaching out in a positive way in that community, you know, during that last year of his life. Great, great, great. Good. Excellent. <laughs>